Welcome back everyone to another frame rate of video. Today I want to dive into one of the most important pieces of hardware inside the Xbox Series S, the GPU, which aims to deliver solid performance and next generation features without breaking the bank. But how well does it really perform when it comes to modern gaming and what are your limitations you should know about? Well, we have a lot to talk about for sure, but before I dive in, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. That way you can catch my tech videos when I decide to drop them, where I go into gaming console hardware, computer hardware, tech in general. And if you like this video, make sure to smash the like button. That way YouTube will actually show it to other people who enjoy it as well. I really appreciate all your support. Now let's go ahead and just dive right in. Now the Xbox Series S is a custom RDNA 2 based chip developed by AMD specifically for Microsoft. RDNA 2 is the same architecture that powers not just the Xbox Series S, but also its bigger brother, the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5, as well as AMD high-end PC GPUs, specifically the 6000 series. But of course, the Series S is a more compact and more affordable console, and that means compromises had to be made in raw performance when you compare them to all of the other options out there using RDNA 2. For perspective, it has 20 compute units that run at 1.565 GHz, which provides a total 4 teraflops of compute power, backed up by 10 GB of GDDR6 memory, of which the memory bandwidth is split into two sections, which I'll get into later, this console targets a resolution of 1080p to 1440p gaming. Now, keyword is target resolution. We often see quite different numbers here, and we will break that down as well. So let's dig deeper into the actual specs of the Series S and how it all translates. Starting with compute units, or CUs. As I mentioned, the Series S has 20 of these, which might sound like a solid number, but what do CUs actually do? Compute units are a basic building block for modern GPUs. They handle all the parallel computing tasks that are essential for rendering game graphics, processing shaders, lighting effects, physics, and more. Essentially, more CUs mean more potential for parallel processing, which is important for high graphic settings and smooth graphics performance. For reference, the Xbox Series S's 20 CUs that run at that 1.565 GHz clock speed for 4 teraflops of GPU power are up against its bigger brother's 52 CUs at 1.825 GHz, which I covered in another video last week. And that's where you can really start to see the Series S begin to trail behind in terms of raw power of the Xbox Series X. But don't let that fool you, this console still has plenty of punch for 1080p to 1440p gaming, which is what it's primarily targeted for and designed for, with compromises can even play the latest games that come out as you would expect them to do. Next, let's talk about its clock speeds and overall memory. Clock speeds in simple terms is how fast the GPU can complete tasks. While the Series S runs at 1.565 GHz, which is lower than some of the more powerful consoles, and of course its PC brethren, it's optimized for its intended use case. Targeting those 1080p and 1440p resolutions or lower while still providing next generation features, but admittedly its memory plays a huge role in overall performance too. And in this regard, it is often considered the culprit behind the Series S Delta over the other premium consoles, as the Series S is equipped with 10GB of GDDR6 memory, with 8GB running at a faster 224GB a second bandwidth, which is a massive upgrade over the Xbox One that it seeks out to replace, but the remaining two gigabytes runs at an abysmal 56 gigabytes per second, which is even slower than what we saw in the Xbox One from back in the day. That split is important because it means that there's less high speed of memory available for game assets compared to the Series X, which has 16 total with more unified memory architecture to boot. In practical terms, the memory split can lead to performance bottlenecks, especially when running more demanding games. The less available high-speed memory forces developers to make trade-offs in texture quality and resolution to maintain stable frame rates, and sometimes we even see other sacrifices being made, such as lowered rendering distance on objects and the complete lack of 60 FPS modes compared to its big brother, the Xbox Series S. But in a lot of cases, we can also chalk that up to developers not optimizing properly. Now, in reality, targeting 1080p to 1440p versus what you really see in real world, especially with modern releases, is kind of a diluted gray area. So with these specs, how does it actually perform then? Well, Microsoft marketed it as ideally for 1080p to 1440p gaming, and for the most part, it delivers in a lot of titles, such as Halo Infinite and Forza Horizon 5. However, the Series S memory limitations and just the lack of brute GPU power have been showing up more and more with the more recent newer titles, especially the very demanding ones. Titles like Cyberpunk 2077 and Baldur's Gate 3 have had to cut back on visual fidelity and often drop its resolution to 900p or even lower to maintain frame rates. 
This is especially noticeable when games are built with next-gen features like ray tracing, which is extremely demanding on both GPU and memory bandwidth. And often, you'll see ray tracing just completely absent in Series S titles compared to PlayStation 5 or Series X variants and, of course, PC. So why are these memory constraints such a big deal then? It seems to really inhibit the console. Well, in modern games, especially open world titles or games with a lot of on-screen assets at once, the GPU needs to juggle more data at higher speeds. With the Series S's limited 8GB of fast memory, the console can struggle to hold large textures, detailed models, and complex lighting all at once. Developers either have to lower the resolution, reduce texture quality, sacrifice features, or even lower frame rates in general to compensate. But with all that being said, at the end of the day, we have to remember that the Series S was still an incredible piece of technology for its price point, especially back when it launched in 2020, and it's perfect for casual gamers who don't mind playing anything at 1440p or lower resolutions with lower settings, and even maybe even lower frame rates. It's not going to compete with high-end PCs in any regard, and even the Series X in terms of raw power, it wouldn't make sense if it did. But if you're looking for next-gen gaming with next-gen features and the ability to play the latest and greatest games well beyond what the old consoles, what the Xbox One could do that the Series S replaces, or don't have the money or feel like spending the money on a advanced gaming PC rig, then the Series S holds its own and is the perfect current generation gaming console on a budget. As long as you know that as more demanding games hit the market, these memory limitations and pure lack of compute power are going to become more noticeable. You might find sub 1080p performance being more and more common with features and options completely lacking on a regular basis versus the Series X. And we've talked about it before, but ray tracing and 60 FPS performance modes are the two most common that you currently see with newer titles. And that trend may continue. But there's a huge audience out there that the Series S is perfect for, for $300 to $250, depending on the time of the year and when you can get it. The Series S gives you current generation gaming and features at a cost that makes sense for a lot of folks, especially for certain people. Take my wife, for example, who couldn't tell you the difference between a Series S and a Series X side by side because she doesn't have the gamer eye. She's also not a techie in any regard. And so to her, a $300 cute little Xbox is exactly what she wants and works just fine on a gaming monitor. And then I know plenty of folks out there who have children who are younger, who are just getting into gaming or don't need anything crazy and fancy that are in love with their Series S. And there's also folks out there I know who only play one game an entire year and they don't really play often. It doesn't make sense for them to buy anything more than a Series S and they prefer controller over mouse and keyboard. That also makes sense. So there's absolutely an audience out there for the Series S, but I love diving into the hardware of the Series S and really kind of digging deep into what the main culprit of the lack of performance is. You know, you have situations where it is just general lack of developer engagement on the Series S in terms of optimization, and then you have other incidences where the Series S just can't keep up in certain areas and it only makes sense to spend less time focusing on trying to make it work when it just isn't going to do it well naturally. But that's all I really have for you in today's video. Do you have an Xbox Series S? A Series X? PlayStation 5 or are you team PC Master Race? Comment down below and let me know. I love engaging with you guys in the comments about your setups and your opinions. So feel free to shoot and I will engage back as soon as I can. That's all I really have for you in today's video. I hope you all enjoyed it and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.